you're then looking at the treatment effect and you've controlled for hopefully any other factors that could affect, could affect the outcomes. And then in some cases, even though RCTs are, are the gold standard, you can have uncontrolled trials where these may be necessary and particularly um, maybe for ethical issues. So if you have a treatment that is thought to be particularly effective and the alternative is not particularly effective, then it may be unethical to put people into a, a control group or standard of care um, if the treatment is, is likely to be much more effective. So in, in this sort of situation, you have a single arm trial uh, and shown in the schematic again, very, very simple, but um, you take your sample population, everybody goes into the treatment group, you have a, a, a pre-treatment measure and a post-treatment measure, and from there, you, you'll determine the effectiveness that way. Uh, the problem with this is obviously, just uh, got some people in the waiting room, sorry. Um, the problem with this is that it's very difficult to then determine uh, comparative effectiveness or, or relative effectiveness compared with another treatment or the standard of care. And this is where we'd use propensity scoring as one approach to try to reduce any bias from differences between the study populations and then hopefully uh, create a more valid comparison to determine that, that relative effectiveness. So with propensity scores, the, these are only feasible when you have the individual patient data for, uh, for both the treatment and the comparator. And the propensity score is actually relatively simple to, uh, to calculate. It's a, a logistic regression, which is why you need the, the patient level data. So it's a, a logistic regression with uh, being assigned to, to the treatment or the control group as the dependent variable and then any prognostic baseline characteristics as the independent variables for the logistic regression. So the, the, the prognostic characteristics are typically determined uh, sort of in collaboration with clinicians and, and from subject level knowledge as well. And the aim is that you, you're hopefully going to create a situation where, uh, based on these propensity scores, the patient could have been, could have been assigned to either group because their, their characteristics are similar. And then we'll use those propensity scores to either match patients on their propensity scores or, or weight them. In terms of this, this exchangeability or the, the overlapping propensity scores, I think these are shown really nicely in the figures from uh, Els et al. Uh, 2017 on this right hand side. So if we look at the, the left hand figure, you can see that there's, there's really good overlap here. So this is an example of uh, control patients from one study and beta blockers from another study. Control patients being the blue bars and beta blockers being the orange bars. And then the, the reddish color is, is where the propensity goes propensity scores overlap. So a propensity score of zero would indicate 100% probability of being in the control group and a propensity score of one would be 100% probability of being in the beta blockers group. What you want to see is this sort of overlap where most of these patients could have been, been in either group based on their propensity scores, which means this, this combination of prognostic baseline characteristics uh, are similar between the groups and then you can balance based on where they sit within, within this, this quite narrow range. What you don't really want is to have a lot of patients with a propensity score close to zero or a propensity score close to one because it means that the distributions aren't, aren't going to be overlapping and it's very hard to control for that, uh, that bias with any sort of statistical analysis. So the, the figure on the right shows that quite nicely in that there's little overlap between these groups and any statistical adjustment can make it difficult to, to control for this level of bias really because the, the baseline characteristics are, are clearly quite, um, 
quite separate between the two groups, as shown by the propensity scores being sort of quite widely different. There, there are very few uh, patients in the statin group who are who have a propensity score close to zero, which is where most of the, the control patients are. So once you have the propensity scores and, and there's a reasonable degree of overlap, as I said, we can then use that for either a matching approach or a balancing approach, um, or other approaches as well. Um, matching and balancing are very commonly used. So for matching, it, it would be taking patients with similar propensity scores or within, within a, a, specified, a specified standard deviation of the propensity scores typically, and taking that as a subset of the population and performing the analysis on those patients. And with that, you obviously, you, you will lose some patients in the analysis, but they'll, they'll be quite closely matched on propensity score. The alternative, uh, the alternative approach that's commonly used is, is balancing, which uh, is what we'll use for my example today. And one balancing approach is to use stabilized weights. And there are other approaches as well. So inverse probability of Treatment weighting, I believe, was used prior to stabilised weights. This is effectively a, a stabilised version of that, that same analysis. And the idea with stabilised weights is that a, a greater weighting is given, so this second bullet point here, so the observations which appear on one group that have a small probability of being found in that group. So it, it's effectively taking, I suppose, it's, taking the patients in the sample that are less well represented from the data set and increasing their weight. So all, almost increasing the sample size of the, the patients that are missing or where there should be more in that data set. And the idea is that that will then give a, a stronger distribution uh, to make the data sets more balanced for that analysis. And to perform the stabilized weights, th these are the uh, the formula, and I'm just showing this because we'll include this in, in the R code. So for the treated group, we have the stabilized weight SW uh, for each individual with the subscript I, and that just represents the proportion of treated patients, so number of patients on the treatment divided by the total number of patients, and that's divided by the propensity score shown with the, the pi symbol for each individual as well. And then for the control group, the stabilized weight is one minus the proportion of treated patients. So that is, in effect, the proportion of control patients or comparative patients divided by one minus the, uh, the propensity score. And that's because the, the control group, again, 100% probability would be if they had a propensity score of zero, whereas for the treated group, a propensity score of one would be 100% probability of being treated. So that, that, that's the sort of, I suppose, the, the simple overview of, of propensity scoring and stabilized weights. If I now start to look at, at the example and, and what we'll work through in R today, um, this is an example application that we've completed recently, uh, but simplified down for today. And this was to determine the comparative efficacy of a new drug, which we'll call drug B, to the standard of care, uh, which we'll call drug A. And both drugs were approved on the basis of single arm clinical trials. They had a similar inclusion exclusion criteria, which is important because it means the patient should hopefully be relatively closely matched to start with. And the baseline and outcome measurements were the same for each trial, which again is important, so we can actually make relevant comparisons and we were asked to present comparisons before and after propensity score adjustments for each analysis. So what we had were, were three data sets and in the primary data set we had eight subsets. So we had 10 data sets in total, so eight from the primary and then two additional data sets. Uh, 18 baseline variables, 32 endpoint variables, and we're required to produce the mean, standard deviation, median, range, sample size, and p-value for each variable. 
So we had to produce this for the baseline variables before our adjustment, and then the baseline variables after the application of stabilized weights, and then the same end point. So we had 40 tables to produce, and 20 of those included 18 variables, and, and 20 included 32 variables, and each variable had five, um, five outcomes as well, five, five descriptors. So you get to a stage where we have quite a lot of data to present, so it's, it's trying to keep that relatively clean within, a, within the R code. So I think that the pitch today may be more for people who are less experienced in R, who hopefully uh, we may be able to bring over to, to use R or, or, or want to use R more. So we'll work through that and it is mainly just using for loops, so it's nothing too, uh, too complicated for, for, for a lot of the audience, I know. In, in terms of the workflow, just before we move into the code, the, the process for, for completing this work was to determine the optimal propensity score specification. So using the uh, prognostic baseline characteristics and then adjusting these as needed to determine the optimal propensity score so that there was maximal overlap between the two patient groups uh, to hopefully ensure that exchangeability. We then generated the propensity scores uh, using just the logistic regression. Again, nothing too complicated. Then calculating and applying the stabilized weights, which again, you can see is a relatively sim simple formula. From there, it's, it's putting into tables the summary, um, the summary data for the baseline variables, uh, unadjusted, and then after the application of stabilized weights, and then again, the outcome data unadjusted, the outcome data after the application of stabilized weights, and then ultimately formatting the data frames and exporting that to Excel. For today, the, un the only aspect that I think we can sort of do justice to within the time is, is this highlighted in red, so it's the the generation of propensity scores, the applying of the stabilized weights, and then the, the generation of these tables. In terms of exporting to Excel, it, it's just worth saying I use OpenXLSX and I find that a really, a really excellent package. Um, so that's to, to bear in mind if, if people want to want to use that. And I appreciate that this will only cover a, a small part of it. If people have questions, then Obviously, we have the, the channel here, but also um, please let me know uh, by email or if, if you want to discuss at all. So that, that's the end of the, the PowerPoint. I'm, again, conscious of time. So I will try to get straight on with the, the R script. And so hopefully everybody can see this. Yeah, we can see that. Fantastic. And I, I just noticed that um, in my own uh, sort of comfort of, all, of already having installed the package install load, I missed this off what's included in the GitHub. So if anybody watches this and wants to use the code, please just add in install load uh, brackets install load in, in speech marks. So just wait, do I have about five minutes? Is that right? Yeah, you have five minutes. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so, for this, so, so just, just some standard bits. So we've, we've set a seed here so that we have, uh, hopefully everybody will produce the same data set as in this example, which will hopefully help if you're working through as, as a beginner. Um, so we've created a data set, again, just using our norm as in the, the previous presentation. And we will generate these two data sets, one for drug A, one for drug B, and then just have a function here to uh, separate this into five data sets. So for the analysis, we'll have five, uh, five data sets to perform the analysis on, just to show some of the function of the loops. So if we run this, And this will load this up. 
And then just to walk through, walk through the analysis a little bit. So we have five data sets that we're going to work through. And so as, as shown in the previous example, just a for loop. And if A equals one, then we're going to use the first data frame, two, three, four, five, just selecting the different data sets there. And then what it will loop through is the propensity score calculation. So this is the logistic regression model. And if we predict from the logistic regression, that will give us our propensity scores. And from there, we simply apply the stabilized weight formula here to, uh, to gain the weights, which we can then include within the analysis. And then within this loop again, we're just going to add a second loop, so a nested for loop. Uh, we have our, our baseline variables here, and we're going to work through those, and we're ultimately going to separate them back into drug A and drug B to perform a t-test. And then in this example, we just have the mean uh, rather than the other descriptors. And by doing some little moving around here and transposing it, we'll have, um, we'll basically have the, uh, the mean and the p-value working across in columns instead of rows to save space in the, in the tables. And we'll do this for the baseline variables, and then that will close this second, this, uh, this B loop, and then we'll do the same once the stabilized weights are applied for another B loop in here, and then just save the data sets next, and then ultimately do the same for the endpoint data. I realize I'm, I'm rushing through because we're a bit short on time, but I think one of the lessons, if, if you're if you're relatively new to R and it, and it ever looks intimidating, this is quite a lot of code, but it's effectively, it's very much the same code just being repeated. So I think one, once you're comfortable with some basic processes, then, then it becomes very easy to run more and more. And, and the way this is set up, you could add in as many variables as you like, and it will, it will run the analysis. You can add in as many data sets as you like, and it will still run them. You could run, different types of um, propensity score matching or weighting, and it would run through. So it, this could hopefully be used as a, a starting point to work off in the future and, and add in whatever sort of variables you need. So if I, if I run this very quickly, so we've created data sets and we combine them. So if we run this, so we'll, we'll run this loop. So this will generate uh, the baseline tables and the endpoint tables for each data set, so five data sets. And then, so you see there's a, 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 lot, of, uh, a lot of data frames created. And then we'll remove just so that we have the ones we want. So we have the, the baseline, uh, variables with stabilized weights, baseline and adjusted, so these are for data sets one to five, and the same at endpoint. And then just to show how uh, sort of the benefits of propensity scarring and and the use of stabilized weights, if we look at these here, so if we have the, the baseline and adjusted variables, we can see that baseline LDH, so lactate dehydrogenase, is significantly different between groups at baseline. And then at endpoint, it is almost significant. So there's a, a trend towards significance, a p value of 0 0.07. But when stabilized weights are applied, you can see that the baseline LDH is now uh, a long way from significance. It's, it's a p value of point zero, sorry, 0.97. And then because of that, the endpoint, it hasn't actually changed it too much, but it's changed it uh, to be ever so slightly less significant, I suppose. LDH maybe wasn't the best, uh, the best choice of example there. But you can see that it, that it, uh, it certainly reduces the bias at baseline and, and hopefully makes the, the endpoint comparison more, uh, more valid. I think.
So if I leave it there and then and then take five minutes of questions, I appreciate that's been a, a bit of a rush, but uh, open to 